here just a minute. Look at that neighbor. Tell them, neighbor, you might be going through hell right now. It will get
you somebody else that ain't jealous about what God's getting ready to do for you. And tell them, say, neighbor, I'm getting ready to celebrate better on the way to my home, on the way to my job, on the way to my ministry. Shout better. Tennessee. We're so thankful 
that you have tuned in to the Word Network on this evening. We pray that you've already been blessed by the praise that has gone forth. But listen, the night is not over. There's some more music. We've got a special instrumental presentation that is going to bless you real good. I'm going to minister the word in, indeed, and we're going to share with you some of the great things that we're doing around the world as the Pentecostal Assemblies of the world. We welcome you. We thank God for you tuning in on today. Listen, there are so many opportunities and options that you have in Christian television, Christian radio, and secular television and radio, but you have tuned in to the Word Network on tonight, and I believe that God has a blessing with your name on it. Thank you for tuning in on this evening. Listen, there is an address and there is instructions right there. If you are blessed by this ministry on tonight and you want to sow a seed into this great August body and this reformation, we certainly will thank you and we will welcome it as it takes finances to do the Lord's work. So anytime that you wish, the information is right there on the screen and we certainly appreciate whatever you can do for us. Know that we're praying for you and we love you to life in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, all of us that are pinnacle assembly of the world let's appreciate all of our viewers from around the world on the word network if you will stand at this time we will have our invocation by the honorable first assistant presiding bishop richard e young from fort worth texas we will have the reading of the scripture by the honorable second assistant presiding bishop theodore brooks from new haven connecticut and then we will have a welcome to all of you on the word network from the host diocesan bishop bishop sherman merritt right here in nashville tennessee and then our great choir will come with a selection put your hands together as they come in this order if you will just reach out and join hands with one another as we prepare to go before the Lord in prayer. God is an answering, a prayer answering God. Somebody asked the question, is there anything that's too hard for the Lord? You that are watching this on the Word Network, and you that are watching on streaming, if there's someone with you, we would ask you just to pause and grab them by the hand as we go before the Lord in prayer. Eternal God, our Father, giver of every good and perfect gift, it is with praise and thanksgiving that we enter into your court. We thank you, we bless you, we praise you. And even if we had 10,000 tongues, we would not be able to praise you for all that you have provided, for all that you have done for us. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, this open door that you have given the Pentecostal assemblies of the world an opportunity to reach out around the globe and tell somebody the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Father, I pray your blessings upon everyone that is gathered in this place. I pray for those who are watching over the Word Network or streaming this service. I pray for them and I ask that whatever the need is that you would provide it. You promise to supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory. Somebody needs you right now. Somebody needs a touch from heaven right now. Somebody watching this telecast is depressed, is discouraged, is disappointed somebody is challenged of God in their faith tonight I pray that you would touch them even right now before this service is concluded that you would turn some things around and help them to remember that because you are in control 
things have got to get better we give you the praise we believe in you for signs wonders and miracles around this globe bless our presider tonight strengthen him anoint him and use him to share with us the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall give you the praise we shall give you all the glory now come on you that are here in this sanctuary release those hands and put them together give God praise for the victory you have up in your life God bless you as you may stand and we shall read unto you tonight the word of the Lord coming to us from Philippians the third chapter we should begin reading at the 14th, the 10th verse rather, down to the 14th. Hear ye the word of the Lord on tonight. The Apostle Paul writes to this church and he poses them this thought that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. I want to be like him. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though it's already attained, either were already perfect, but, somebody say but, I follow after, if that I may apprehend that, for which also I have apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. I don't understand everything. I can't figure out everything. But he says, but this one thing that I do, I'm forgetting. Somebody needs to forget. I'm forgetting the things that are behind me. But I'm reaching forward. I don't know about I'm reaching forward unto those things which are set before us. And because of that, we're pressing. Anybody in here pressing? I press toward the mark for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Praise the Lord, everyone. It is my opportunity to uh, give thanks and praise to the Lord because uh, I'm here to make a greeting. But nobody can give a better greeting than what we have felt already in this place this week where the anointing of the Lord has flowed continuously and where we felt him every night. On behalf of the First Apostolic Council of Kentucky and Tennessee and the Diocese of Bishop Sherman Merritt and Sister Vera Merritt, we'd like to welcome you to the great city of Nashville, Tennessee, amen, where we guarantee uh, that if you come in here, you'll never go out of here the same. God bless you.
neighbor, I've seen it work. Come on, tell that other neighbor, I've seen it work. God bless you, choir. Give them a hand. I'm going to ask our first and assistant presiding bishop to join me at the pulpit, the podium. If they can bring me uh, the two plaques. Thank you. I have had the honor to serve as presiding bishop seemingly in a season where many of our bishops have become seasoned and have determined that their time and that space of service has come to an end for them as an active bishop in diocesan. And it is with mixed emotions because we have seen these men in their youth and we have seen them, Bishop Smith, Bishop Bowers, in what we would call the heyday. And everyone, as time moves on, it takes its toll on all of us. I am just delighted that many of these, we've been able to honor them not when they're stretched out in front of us. But we've been able to honor them while they can yet smell the flowers. We call forth Bishop Vanuel Little. Bishop Vanuel Little, amen, the powerhouse that God used to save many souls hailing from Alabama and then Chicago. Bishop Brazier's church, the Apostolic Church of God, served there as assistant pastor until he took the pastorate of a church in Oklahoma City. Bishop Daniel Little was in Oklahoma City for such a time that when that city experienced that horrific tragedy of the bombing of that federal building, it was Bishop Little, it was his family, it was his church, his membership as well as his facility that served to be a beacon of hope in the midst of utter despair. They had many of those funerals at his church. His church was active in comforting many of those families, many of them who did not have a church, but he opened his doors to lay those loved ones to rest. Bishop Daniel Little has said that his time as an active bishop has come to an end, requesting emeritus status. And we are so honored that he is yet here and able to smell the flowers and to receive the accolades that we present to him and bestow upon him. I will ask Bishop Richard Young our first assistant presider to read the plaque that we hope will hang proudly in his office, in his home, his den, library, wherever he chooses to hang it and to display it. We hope that it will serve as a token of our appreciation, our love, and our esteemed affection for his service here at the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. The Episcopal honor of Bishop Emeritus is bestowed upon Bishop Daniel C. Little for 28 years of honorable and committed service to the mission and vision of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. Your leadership and godly influence has been exemplary and of great value to our executive board from 1989 to 2017. Wow. Bishop Charles H. Ellis III, presiding prelate, Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. And along with his plaque, we have a token 
a monorary token of appreciation for the Honorable Bishop Vanuel Little. Secondly, he is not fortunate enough to be here. We retired and granted emeritus status to the beloved Bishop Michael Garrett, who served honorably in this organization. It was in May that we granted him emeritus status. Two months later, he made his transition. We want to still honor him because we officially retired him and we feel that his family, his church, his widow, children should receive all that emeritus bishops should receive. They were not able to come to this convention, but his suffragan bishop, Suffolk Bishop Preston Norm, Norman Preston, Preston Norman and a man Mr. Gilda Lafayette yes he belongs to his used to belong to his church I'm sure that they will make sure that First Lady Margie receives what we have for them and I'm sure that they will appreciate it I asked the second assistant presider Bishop if he would read the plaque the Episcopal honor of Bishop Emeritus is owed upon Bishop Michael J. Garrett, Sr. For 13 years of honorable and committed service to the mission and vision of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. His leadership and godly influence has been exemplary and of great value to our executive board. From 2004 to 2017, the Honorable Bishop Charles H. Charles III presided prelate of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. Come on, give God praise for our fathers for the time that they have given and for the work that they have done. At this time, we ask you to give your attention to the screens. We have our millions for missions video and we want you to see some of the things that we're doing with our missions department and how you can help and participate to ensure that the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World has a healthy and a vibrant missions campaign. The International Mission Department of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World is making an impact with your many prayers and donations. This group of dedicated workers are putting God's Word into action and helping others. Assisting those in need is our mission and main priority. The Pentecostal Assemblies of the World International Missions Department continues to shape the future for change, expand its reach to all 36 foreign dioceses, and impact lives. 
You know, I'm so grateful for the tremendous leadership that we have in our missions department. You know, when I look back over the years and over the decades in this organization, we've had some great men and women who have served in the missions department. And we're so very fortunate to have Subdivision Bishop Greg Urban now at the helm and his most capable staff that work with him so diligently. I mean, they have really taken it to a whole nother level. We are building beyond borders and assisting several foreign projects. Great progress has been made over the last few years. It says the International Missions Department of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World Incorporated hereby proclaims that we will complete the construction of the compound's security fence in Nigeria, West Africa. This fence will be funded by the PAW International Missions Department. We want to enter into this agreement with the Nigerian Diocese on this fourth day of August, 2016. The Bishop Emeritus Inibom Ephraim, our missions chairperson, Suffolk Bishop Gregory Irving, and the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World stand behind it. Grace and peace. I'm so pleased to share with you some of the things that God has been doing with the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World International Missions Department. I also want to take this time to thank all of those that have been a part of Million for Missions and encourage all of you that are watching this to engage to be a part of Million for Missions. God has blessed us to be able to do some great things. With the help of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World International Mission Department, we have been able to assist in the completing of the 90-acre compound fence in Nigeria, West Africa. With your help, we were also able to provide new equipment in the science lab at the Haywood Institute in Liberia, West Africa. Give one dollar every day and pray. And you know what else is such a blessing is when disaster strikes that the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World is right there ready to jump in and to send the relief that many of these countries need. More specifically, recently, Haiti, the disaster that was there, the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World was able to send relief within 48 hours. That is tremendous. And I'm sure those individuals that received that relief are so glad that the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World had them on their mind. If you take a few moments and look at the dramatic changes around the world, the rise of disaster and hunger, it's clear that there is great need to spread God's love across the world. According to God's word, we have been commissioned to go and give. Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. 1 Corinthians 13.13 13 compels us to give. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. For the Pentecost Assembly of the world now to have 36 international dioceses, from where we began so many decades ago is absolutely tremendous. But in order for them to really feel a part of this great organization, we must fellowship with them and we must sow our seed to help them where they need it the most. So for us to reach all 36 in one year, it will be absolutely astronomically a blessing to all of those individuals in all of those places. Let's do it. Give one dollar I believe that the Millions for Missions campaign is definitely a goal that can be accomplished this year. I truly believe that when people come together on one accord and they're passionate, they're excited, they know that, um, that there's a tremendous need, that if we come together as one, there's absolutely nothing that we cannot do together. The International Missions Department has several strategic plans to ensure the future works within the organization. We can achieve success with a small effort when each of us participates.
participate in something bigger than ourselves. It's simple. Join the Million for Missions campaign. Just give $1 a day for one year and pray. Be a part of sharing God's love. A Million for Missions. Your gift is making change. Come on and give God praise on today. As I prepare to give you some information, I call Master Hayden Jackson to the keyboard, who is going to bless us. A millions for missions. I'm going to ask that Suffolk Bishop Gary Irving comes quickly, our International Missions Department Chair. I'm going to ask him to remain on the stage because we've got some other presentations that he's going to be a part of in just a few minutes. And I want him to share with you. Amen, Master Jackson, you can come and arrange yourself. This young man, well, he used to be young. He once was young. Now he's still young, not as young. He's doing a phenomenal job as our missions department chairperson. Suffolk Bishop Greg Irvin. We're asking everyone to do your very best to give $365 just for one year. It's not every year, and certainly I believe that once you give, you're going to be so blessed by God that you're going to continue sowing seed. But we're just asking everybody a dollar per day. Now, I know that's hard to keep up with every single day, so many of you can just write a check for $365. You can break it up into a monthly, 12 monthly installments. But if all of us do a little bit, we can reach our goal in raising a million for missions. Give God praise. Just today, in our luncheon, we were able at our luncheon to give each foreign diocese a check. As we had stated, let's give the Lord a hand in praise. Come on, give God a hand in praise. And we also have been very transparent in the things that we're doing financially. Every dime that has been designated for a particular area or diocese, it has gone to that diocese. Give God another praise. And so, under the direction of our presider, we are striving to make this thing happen. And we believe that every one of you all, and I know that God will touch your heart, and we know that you will be able to do it. Every one of our board members on last year, we gave 365. And now, this year in 2017, every one of our board members have given 365. We're asking you to join us in this great effort. As we go forward to do this, as, as it has already been stated, is not something hard for us to do. Where there is unity, there is strength. Thank you so much for every small gift that you have given. But I know that you allow God to speak to your heart. You'll be able to fulfill this purpose. And we will reach this goal and even go beyond this goal of a million this year. Come on, give God a praise and give him honor. And I want the missions uh, department, uh, Southern Bishop Irvin, uh, let's make sure that we get the information from the vending area. I want to get it out here in the lobby so that we can put something in everybody's hand so that they can know exactly how they can participate. Last thing I want is for folks to say, I didn't know how to, I didn't know. We're going to make sure you know before you leave here. It is our goal next year, this time, I think Bishop Gray, uh, uh, James Greg Rogers preached about this time tomorrow. Amen. I'm not saying tomorrow, but by this time next year, we want to report from this pulpit that we have $1 million, not in our organization treasury, but in our missions treasury. Tell that neighbor we can do it. Put your hands together and welcome Maestro Hayden Jackson.
Somebody say it'll never lose its power. It'll never lose its power. Tell that neighbor it'll never lose its power. Somebody ought to just give God a wave. Just, just, just give God a wave. say he's our own Pentecostal assemblies of the world. Come on, put your hands together one more time. Amen. Brother Hayden has a CD available. Looks like it has four cuts. One of them is a medley. I want to make sure Disregard to have the Son of Bishop Harris to make sure that we allow him to use our international guest services table to be able to offer his product. A gift like this, the world would love to have it. But thank God he's using his talents for the Lord. And we want to do everything to encourage him to continue. One more time, put your hands together for Brother Hayden Jackson. I ask again for our assistants to come along with Bishop Smith, our former presiding bishop. If someone can bring me the checks that we have, and we call Bishop Gary Harper, Bishop of Ghana. Bring me all of the checks. Right. 
I ask for someone to bring my mother and my family up as well. Bishop Montador, please come. Somebody bring Bishop Montador. Bishop Moses Butler, please come. Bishop Pennell, will you come and represent Bishop Nice? And we ask for Bishop Leo and Lady Myra Simpson to come as well. Bishop Moses, by the you want to represent? Thank you. Hey Amen. Let my mom sit in my seat. I'm gonna make her presider for a few hours, for a few minutes, ah. rather. Hey Amen. But she's not preaching tonight. We want to begin with Bishop Harper and. We have been blessed to have individuals to sow into our Ghana District Council. It was a council, stand up Bishop Mona Reed. Amen. It was a council that she helped to create and initiate. It is Bishop Mona Reed up and Sister Kathy Jones of Greater Grace Temple that were given the green light by my father to go to Ghana, West Africa and to preach the gospel message and to dig out a work. After these two young ladies finished, we had 22 churches in Ghana, West Africa. At that time in 99, we did not elevate women to the bishopric. So I was elevated to the bishopric and was able to serve over that council to 2000 and 11 when Bishop Harper became the diocesan of that council. And we are honored to share with Bishop Harper what has been done over this past year to the Ghana District Council, if you grab the other end, 11,198 dollars. Mr. Harper, if you'll hold that, and we'll take pictures, and we'll take them, so we'll go over one time to take pictures. If you can just stand back, and I call now Bishop Joseph Montanor. Thank you. Bishop Montanor is the diocesan of our Haiti District Council, and we are honored to share with him $4,500. Bishop Sims is going to represent the Dominican Republic. Nigeria, thank you. Dominican Republic. Bishop Larry Thompson is going to represent Dominican Republic, $2,650. Representing Bishop Nice and Bishop Inabam Ephraim of our Nigerian District Council, $12,500. As you all saw in the last year that we guaranteed to finish the fence at the amount of $12,500, that fence has been completed, the property has been enclosed, and everything is in safekeeping because we have fencing around the property. Give God praise. And all of that property belongs to the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. Amen. Where's Bishop Simpson? I hope they are here. I saw them. Contributing to our Liberian West African Council, 
$31,521. And I asked my mother to come and my family, my son, Charles IV, and, and my eldest sister, the one that got the seven of us going, and second to the eldest, Starlet Teresa, my mother, Wilma Ruth Ellis, I wouldn't dare tell their age. I'm 59 and Starlet is three years older than me. But I, I wouldn't dare tell her age. And Teresa's one year younger than her and I wouldn't tell her age either. Uh, it was Bishop Wilmot Sampson that wanted to honor my father in putting together a memorial institute, a school for children. Bishop Sampson passed and the work went into ruin. Bishop Leo Simpson became the Bishop of Liberia and he wanted to get the work back going. We asked him what did he need. He said he needed $20,000 to get the work going. My father always said, Anything with your name on it, take care of it. So since they thought enough of my father to honor his memory and to put his name on that school, the Ellis Family Foundation is contributing $20,000 to the David Lee Ellis Memorial Institute. If you would just entertain us, and while we're taking these pictures, I'll ask the choir to come and gather themselves, and they will be up next. This is why we need the millions for missions, because we have work to do, and there is so much work to do. Tell that neighbor, I can be a part of the solution. Now say, I will be a part of the solution. Come on, one more time, put your hands together and give God praise for our mission's work. There is so much more to be done, so much more that can be done, but we need your help. Amen. Those of you that are watching again over the Word Network and those of you that are streaming, 
I certainly hope that you are encouraged and you're inspired by what we are doing, not just here in the United States of America, but literally all over the world. And this is just a snippet of the things that we are doing. I'm certain that many of you contribute to benevolent causes and to nonprofits, and we certainly hope that you will pray and ask the Lord, amen, to lay something on your heart to do for the PAW that we might help to continue to bring relief all over this world. We thank you so very kindly for tuning in on today. I want to specially thank my good friend and partner, Mr. Kevin Adele, uh, the owner and the president of the Word Network. I want to thank my nephew, Brother Dave Sheffield, the station manager, and Brother Quentin Ross also, who is the chief editor for helping to broadcast this service literally around the world. Thank God for friends and great relationships. Please put your hands together for the Word Network. Thank you so kindly. Please receive our mass choir.
We're so very happy. Thank you, choir. We're so very happy to have one who has made our stay comfortable and very hospitable, who works for the state government. I want him to come and to greet you at this time and to greet our World Word Network audience from not just the United States, but all over this world. Please receive Representative Harold Love. Good evening to presiding Bishop Ellis, host Bishop Merritt, your board of bishops, your emeritus bishops, your general officers, your lay directors, your auxiliary directors, your delegates, and members of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World 102nd Summer Convention. I bring you greetings on behalf of the Tennessee House of Representatives, for I have the pleasure to serve in the 58th District. Indeed, your theme, Onward and Upward, is most needed now, as indeed our city and our state, our country and our world is in need of God-filled, Holy Ghost-driven, uh, people who know what love is like, what compassion is needed. Uh, indeed, I will remind you of the words of Jesus uh, that he said to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth. Uh, but if the salt loses its savor, what good will it be? Uh, we need you to keep doing what you're doing. Uh, keep letting us know it's going to be all right. If you keep on praying and keep believing that God will indeed make a way out of sometimes seemingly no ways. Uh, it's hard sometimes working in the legislature trying to do what's right. But I'm encouraged, Bishop, uh, by the fact that there are praying men and women in this auditorium right now who are doing good work. And I also want to thank you for the work that you're doing in Africa and across the world uh, to make sure that young boys and girls can go to school in safe environments. And so I'm not going to take up too much of your time. I'm waiting for a preacher to come, and so I'm going to go have my seat and wait for the preacher to come. Uh, but I'm glad to be here again, and I want to thank you so much. And I would be remiss if I did not uh, bring you greetings on behalf of my bishop, Bishop Jeffrey Nathaniel Leith of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, right here in Kentucky and Tennessee. So thank you again, Bishop, for your time, and God bless you. Please give Representative Love a hand. Tell that neighbor there is a word from the Lord. If you would stand to your feet. Because of who you are, I give you glory. Come on, somebody help me say it. Because of who you are, I give you praise. Oh, because of who you are, I will lift my voice. Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Lord, I worship you. Come on, extend them hands to heaven because of who, because of who you are. I give you glory. Yes, I do. Because of who you are, I give you praise. Lord, I give you praise because of who you are. I will lift my voice. Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Come on, who is it to you? Jehovah Jireh. You're my provider. Jehovah Nisi.
was in the first song that the writer pens these words. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night, night and day, day and night. And he shall be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in its season. His leaf also shall not wither. I love this phrase here. And whatsoever he doeth, somebody shout, shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. It doesn't work for them. They are like the chaff, which the wind <laughs> drives and blows away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Read that last verse with me. Read one, two, three. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Read it again. For the Lord knoweth the way of the, the way of the ungodly shall perish. One more time. Read it. For the Lord knoweth. Stop. That's the subject. Tell that neighbor, the Lord knows. Tell that other neighbor, the Lord knows. Lord, bless your servant on this evening. Give us a word that will bless your people. We thank you for the souls saved earlier today. Just got the report that the young people are being baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost at Bishop Sherman Marriage Church right now as we speak. We thank you for our youth at another location. Now let your glory be revealed in everything we do and say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Tell that neighbor the Lord knows. It is here in this text that we receive words and confirmation of the omniscience of God. We understand that the omniscience of God speaks to us the fact that God is all knowing or that he knows everything. When I take that into consideration and consider myself to have received salvation, Sometimes I have a difficult time reconciling the two. I received salvation because people told me you need to get saved. And it wasn't like I was living a miserable life of sin. My parents wouldn't let me live that life. I could live sin, but I couldn't live a miserable life of sin. They wouldn't let me get way out there. There were certain things that we didn't need the Holy Ghost to keep us from doing. Our parents kept us from doing. You will not do that. You will not go there. You will not hang with those folk. So when I think about salvation, I've come to the conclusion that salvation guarantees heaven, but it does not prevent trouble. Oh, if you have salvation, you are absolutely going to heaven. But just because you're going to heaven because you have received salvation does not mean that you won't have trouble. The misnomer is that many have witnessed the people and told them, you need to come out the world. You come out that world, everything going to be fine. And sometimes the exact opposite happens. Anybody in here 
when you got saved, that's when all hell broke loose. When you got saved, your troubles didn't disappear. But sometimes it got worse before it got better. The problems seem to intensify. And I found out maybe that's why Paul recorded that we walk by faith and not by sight. Because sight represents the natural and the carnal man. Faith represents the spiritual man. And I have learned that it takes faith to navigate through the wicked and the evil terrains of this life. You see, sight sometimes causes me to struggle in maintaining my spiritual equilibrium. It seems to be this continual tug of war within my humanity. This pulling and shoving. And this rocking and bending and reeling that seems to be perpetual in our lives. Sometimes I'm excited and passionate about the things of God. But Bishop Smith, sometimes I struggle just to do the bare essentials. Sometimes I'm excited to go to church. Then other times I have to do everything I can just to get my clothes on, to get out the house, and to go to the house of the Lord. Sometimes I don't need no praise and worship leader. I have a testimony. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. But then there are other times when I can be in the service and the anointing is in the room and everybody is jumping and dancing and I'm sitting there seemingly my mind is somewhere else. Sight causes me to struggle. It causes me to be moving in and out and up and down and going through all of these various emotions. When it comes to my Christian walk, some months I'm doing fine. And some other weeks and some other months, I need a spiritual energy boost, spiritual Red Bull, just to get my energy up. That I can just shout out a praise or give God an enthusiastic clap. No wonder Paul said again in his word that sometimes when I would do good, evil is always present. Am I talking to some real people up in here? I'm going to find me a transparent section. Sometimes that that I want to do, I find myself not feeling up to doing it. And that that I shouldn't be doing, it always gravitates and pulls me to it. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? You see, brothers and sisters, my sight, the things I see, causes me to make an attempt to reconcile or rationalize, rationalize things that really make no sense to me. Sometimes, my brothers and sisters, I feel that the Lord really isn't aware of what's really going on in this world. Sometimes I feel, I mean, if God knew, then why would this be happening? I mean, if God knew, then why did he allow that to happen? Because I've learned that nothing happens unless God gives it the approval. So if everything has to come through God's approval process, then how in the world could I be dealing with so much pain? if God sees me where I am. I remember you all teaching me about 
him being omniscient. But to be quite transparent and to be honest, there are times when I have to ask myself the question, does the Lord really know? It's difficult for the human intellect to believe that a good God could allow so many evils to bombard people of God. You know, sometimes we just like to simplify things and you know, we try to keep things relatively simple like, you know, like, like, like you know, if I was God. I mean, if I was God, things would be very clear. I would bless good people and I would curse bad people. I mean, if I was God, it'd be simple. I'd give longevity of life to good people and church people and people who are upstanding. And I would bring an early death to those that are perpetrating evil, violence, and chaos in this world. I mean, I mean if I was God, I would just make good people rich and bad people poor. But then I learned that as good as I think I am, there have been some times that I've missed them all. There have been some times that I've stumbled and have fallen. And if God was as simplistic as me, then maybe I wouldn't even be here today. So I have to just thank him for his grace and thank him for his mercy and come to the sober and humble reality that I'm not the only one that deserves grace from God. I'm not the only one that deserves mercy from God. That's why the writer tells us that he reigns on the just as well as the unjust. And just when you think that you can figure out God, he tells you that his ways are not your ways. And his thoughts are not your thoughts. So for the lack of understanding and for the lack of faith, Many struggle on this Christian journey pondering the question, does God know? After all, if the Lord knew my pain, then why has he not erased it? The Lord sees my tears at night. Then why is he allowing me to drown in them if the Lord feels my burden? Why does it seem that he allows me to crumble underneath it? And then sometimes I go to church and I look for somebody to lift me up. I look for somebody to give me a pat on the back. I look for somebody to sympathize with what I'm going through. And sometimes I run into one of those super saints. Those folk that ain't never nothing bothering them. And then they try to minimize my pain. I lost my daddy and I'm still crying a year later. You still crying? You should have been done got over that by now. You still whining? You should have been able to move on past that by now. I wish to God you had a daddy like I had. That you could be crying 21 years later. Well, you know the words say, weeping only and do it for a night. But joy coming in the morning. But he didn't tell me which morning joy was coming. And what do you do? When you cried all night Sunday and Monday, you still in the dumps. You done cried all night Tuesday and Wednesday and you still in the dumps. You done cried Thursday and Friday 
and you still can't seem to get yourself out of it. And folk trying to make you think that they can just throw a scripture at you and everything is going to be fine. They can just throw a scripture at you and you're supposed to forget all your hurt, forget all your pain, forget that that man left you bankrupt didn't pay the bills for six months before leaving you and left you with those kids uh, and there you are struggling all by yourself and then they just come and throw a scripture but you know he knows how much you can bear but I still got to pay bills and I still got to feel unwanted I still got to feel lonely don't just throw no scripture at me I done read scriptures all my life Folk throw a scripture at you. It ain't nothing but the logos. It ain't nothing but the written word. But there are times when you need a rhema word from God. I don't need you throwing no scripture at me. I need God to send me a word that's going to lift my burden. That's going to dry my tears. And that's going to help me to shake off. What's got me down? Reminded of the story church mother who was seasoned in Pentecost. It was a young girl who gotten saved. Mother was her mentor. And she was struggling because she had come out of the world. She was struggling, leaving some of those things behind. The devil was coming against her and she would go and talk to her mentor, the mother. The mother said, daughter, Listen here, the devil is a liar. I want you to say it. She said, the devil is a liar. She said, now go on and walk in victory. And three weeks later, young girl came back struggling with another burden. Mother, I need some help. The devil is trying to mess with my mind. Sweetheart, the devil is a liar. Shout it, declare it, speak it. Go on about your business. She did that several times. Then, one season, the young lady noticed that mother had been missing for about four weeks. She went over to mother's house, said, mother, we ain't seen you at church. What's going on? She said, honey, the devil is up in this house. He's trying to destroy me. So the young girl thought that she would share with mother what encouraged her. And she said, mother, the devil is a liar. She said, mother, look back and say, he ain't lying this time. Sometimes it's easy for you to give somebody a word when you ain't going through nothing. It's easy for you to chastise some people when you ain't felt the sting of death. When you ain't felt the sting of having to get off drugs and having to get rid of those vices that have you down, uh, sometimes we got to be patient with people and stop throwing scriptures at them uh, and take them and love them and hug them and caress them uh, and tell them, I'm going to help you to get through this. I'm going to pull you through this. I'm going to lift you through this. I'm going to carry you through this. Ask that neighbor, can you give me a lift? Sometimes you feel that the Lord doesn't know. You feel that he is not concerned about your plan. After all, if God sees me every night crying my heart out, then why would he leave me in this condition? If God knows the burden that I have in my spirit, if God knows the weight that seems to be bearing me down. Then why would he leave me where I am? But I came to tell the PAW and all of those that are watching this telecast on this night that don't let the devil tell you that God is not concerned. He sees you where you are. He feels your burden that you carry. He sees your tears in the midnight hour. I thank God that we have a high priest who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. 
That means that everything that we are going through, everything that we've gone through, everything that lies ahead of us, we ought to know that the Lord has already been through it. And if he's been through it, he's able to bring us through it. I wish I had a believer just to shout, he's able up in here. Shout, he's able again. So we must understand that it comes a time when things are not what they appear to be. Sometimes it looks like God has turned a deaf ear on us. It seems like God has turned his back on the people of God. But you've got to believe that God knows what you're going through. You've got to believe that God sees your burden and that he feels your pain and that he knows what you're going through. Somebody just tell that neighbor, the Lord knows. Sometimes it seems like he doesn't know, but he knows anyhow. When I think about my father, sometimes it seemed like he didn't know what we were doing. And when I look at the example of my dad in some of my early adolescent years, I can see now how God works sometimes because it seems that it's parallel. Y'all remember back in the old church days when we didn't have children's church and they just let the young people have a section in the back of the sanctuary. When our church began to fill up, we had a section in the back. On Puritan and Dexter didn't have a whole lot of members. So all the kids sat on the front row. But when we got over to the synagogue and the church began to fill up, they put all of us in the back corner. It was about at that time that I was 12 going on 13. And when you a real young boy, 12 going on 13, you begin to start realizing that girls are not boys. You stop putting them in headlocks. You stop pulling on their ponytails because they start getting curves and start feeling out. So you realize now that girls are, are something totally different than you. And it was at that time that we started getting interested in girls. And I go easy on the young people nowadays at Greater Grace Temple. Sometimes folk want to be hard on the young people. I have sometimes the missionaries come, Bishop, you know these kids just texting one another here in church. You know they ain't using them phones for the scripture. They just talking to one another and the mother leave the children alone. Let the folk, let them stay in church. Be thankful that they're in church. We did the same thing. We just didn't have no smartphone. We didn't have no tablet. But we wrote our own little epistles in church. They were no long epistles. Didn't have three and four chapters of 12 and 13 verses. They were just small epistles on a little paper like this. And we would write on our paper, do you like me? And we would draw two boxes and write on the top of one, yes. And on the top of the other, no. And then we would write at the bottom, check the right box. We would fold our little epistle up and we would pass it down the road. And we would tell our buddy, give it to her. And the epistle would go down the road and you'd be looking, following it down the road. And sometime my cousin Ray, he knew who I wanted it to go to. But instead of giving it to Leah, Rachel, he gave it to Leah. And she looked down and said, no man, not her. I remember one of those Sunday nights, I was writing my 
first book of Chucky. Chapter number one and verse one. I sent it down the road. Do you like me? But when it got down to the end of the road, one of those FBI missionaries, one of those KBG mothers, one of those investigative missionaries, probably Putin's cousin, she said, hand me that note. She looked at the note and said, who wrote the note? And Ray and all of them pointed, Chucky wrote that note. Mother said, I'm going to tell Elder Ellis, you're going to get in trouble tonight. I said, Lord, I got to get saved when the altar call comes. But the curious thing is that after service, my dad act like he didn't know. I was walking around him to see if he was going to say something. And he just ignored me and didn't say nothing. So I said to myself, he don't know. And I said, I'm in good shape. And that Sunday night, didn't have two cars, didn't have a Cadillac. Had an old green station wagon. And that note, I got in the station wagon. Y'all don't know about the station wagon. The last seat was facing backwards. And all my boys was out there saying, you going to get it. But I looked back, Mark Tarbin, and said, he don't know. And the station wagon pulled off. And I'm sitting in the back, cool, calm, and collected. Got home, took a bath, got my PJs on, got in the bed, getting ready for Monday morning school. Cut the lights off. Spencer and Dave Jr. in the front part of the room. I had a big double bed toward the other part of the room. And out of nowhere, the door opened. And we had a little hall light on. And I can see the silhouette. The shape of a man. It was my daddy cut the light on and looked down and said, you thought I didn't know. And commenced to whipping me from one end of that bedroom to another. I told you about courting in church. I told you you too young for that. I told you, daddy, I ain't gonna do it no more. That let me to know that just because he acted like he didn't know, that didn't mean that he didn't know. And I came to tell somebody that sometimes it looked like the Lord is ignoring you. But you got to know that he's got you on his mind. You got to know that he sees every tear that you've cried. He sees every burden that you have. He sees the struggle that you're in. And that's why the writer picked it up here in the number one psalm and said, Blessed is the man that standeth not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. He said, you gotta be careful who you're hanging with. You gotta be careful who you're taking counsel from. I dare somebody to tell that neighbor, stop talking to everybody. Stop telling your business to everybody. You need to have a little talk with Jesus and tell him about your troubles. He'll hear your faintest cry and he'll answer by and by. Feel the prayer we're turning and know that the fire's burning. Just a little talk with Jesus. Somebody shout, we'll make it all right. He said, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law that he meditate day and night. Tell that neighbor, you got to read the word. You got to study the word. You got to read the logos until God sends you a rhema. You got to read the logos until God speaks it into your spirit. You got to read the logos. And I declare unto you, you might read the word late at night and fall asleep. But in your midnight hour, in your time of pain, in your time of 
a struggle. God will bring that word up and the logos will become a rhema that will deliver you in the midst of your struggle. If there anybody that's meditating in the word day and night night and day I dare you to tell that neighbor I ain't reading the word to impress you. I'm not reading the word to be better than you. I'm not reading the word just so I can be somebody big. But the reason I'm reading the word of God day and night is so I can be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water that when the winds begin to blow and the breakers begin to dance I might be but I ain't gonna break. Is there anybody that's been at your breaking point? And the devil thought you were going to snap. But before you snap, the Lord sent an angel and pulled you back up and straightened your walk. Do I have a witness in here? Tell that neighbor, I got the word in me. And the word keeps me standing. The word has got me rooted uh, so I can be steadfast, uh, unmovable, uh, always abounding uh, in the work of the Lord. Uh, for as much as I know uh, that my labor uh, is not in vain, uh, he set his lead, uh, also shall not wither, uh, and whatsoever uh, he doeth uh, shall prosper. Uh, I'm trying to get to the place uh, where whatsoever I do, uh, it's got to prosper. Uh, whatsoever I speak, uh, it's got to come to pass. Uh, whatsoever I lay hands on, uh, it's got to recover. Uh, whatsoever I declare, uh, it shall be done. Uh, I dare somebody uh, that say, Lord, uh, give me the Midas touch. Uh, everything I touch, uh, Wanted to turn to gold. Uh, everybody I speak, uh, I want them to prosper. Uh, I dare somebody uh, that will just touch your name uh, and say, Be healed uh, in the name of Jesus. Uh, touch that other name. Uh, tell them, Be whole uh, by the blood of the Lamb. Uh, touch that name behind you. Uh, tell them, God uh, is getting ready to prosper you. Uh, God. Getting ready to open the door uh, that no man can shut. Uh, God uh, is getting ready to open uh, the windows of heaven uh, and pour you out a blessing uh, that you won't have room uh, enough to receive. Uh, he said, but the ungodly uh, are not so. Uh, it ain't gonna work. Uh, they might look good, uh, but they're an accident uh, waiting to happen. Uh, they might drive good, uh, but you ain't going to heaven. Uh, you might live uh, in a gated community, uh, but your soul uh, is bankrupt. Uh, it looks like uh, you're doing better than me, uh, but I'm not looking uh, at the outside. Uh, but there's a power uh, that's on the inside. Uh, I heard David when he said, uh, I began to look uh, and see uh, the prosperity uh, of the wicked. Uh, and my foot uh, almost slipped. Uh, but I remembered uh, to believe to see uh, the goodness of the Lord uh, in the land of the living. Uh, and every now and then, uh, you got to look back uh, and see where God uh, has brought you from. Uh, through danger, uh, through toil, uh, through snare, uh, through sickness, uh, through pain, uh, through struggle, uh, through poverty, uh, through uptime, uh, through downtime, uh, through sickness, uh, through hurt, uh, through hater, uh, through liar, uh, through persecution, uh, and I'm still here. Uh, is there anybody uh, that will give God a praise? Cause you're still here uh, He said that like the child uh, That the wind drives away uh, Therefore the ungodly uh, Shall not stand uh, In the judgment uh, No sinner uh, 
in the congregation of the righteous. And before I get out of here, I just came to tell everybody that the Lord, he knows what you're going through. The Lord, he knows how you feel. The Lord, he knows the tears you say. Don't know about you, but that's 
for me and my house. I'm going to believe that the Lord will make a way somehow. Don't know how, but somehow the Lord will make a way. The Lord will lift my burden. The Lord will establish my foot. The Lord will turn it around. The Lord will right the ship. The Lord will avenge me of my enemies. The Lord will make my enemies be at peace. The Lord will prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The Lord will make the wicked bring me my blessings. The Lord will make the devil bring me my blessings. The Lord will make demons be at peace with me. I wish I had somebody in here that feel the Lord lifting the burden. Lighten your load, just give that neighbor a high five, and tell the neighbor the Lord knows the pain you feel, He knows the burden you bear, He knows the sorrow that you've had to shake, He knows the tears that you had to cry, He knows how you had to walk all by yourself, He knows. When everybody just walked off and left you, just he knows just when people lie on you, just he knows just when the devil tries just to put his foot on your neck, just he knows just when the enemy just tried to destroy you, just but if you're still here, just that means that God just is greater just than the enemy, just so what you need to do just is to praise him just for being right there, just. Praise him, but never leaving you. Praise him, but never forsaking you. Praise him, but delivering you. In six troubles, in seven troubles. Praise him, for blessing you. Over and 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 over. Woo! Do I have a witness in here? I wish somebody would find three people and give them a high five and tell them neighbor, don't wait till the battle is over. But pray them through your tears. Pray them through your hurt. Pray them through your loneliness. Pray them through your pain. Pray them through your sorrow. Pray them through your dilemma. Pray them through your trouble. Let everything that has bread praise. Praise. Praise the Lord! Woo! Do I have any praises in here? Let me get somebody across the eye and just go across that eye and give that neighbor a high five and tell them, neighbor, the Lord knows. Tell them, the Lord knows. Tell them, the Lord sees. The Lord hears. The Lord feels. Everything you going through, and tell a neighbor, everything is going to be all right. Just give him a praise like it's already done. Somebody give him a clap off. 
want to pray for some people quickly. If this message spoke directly to you, sometimes you feel that God is not concerned. Sometimes you feel like he don't know. Get out of this altar quick. Don't take a long time. Move quick. Get in a hurry. I want to touch and agree with you. I want to believe God with you and for you. That he lightens that load. That he lifts that burden. I want to pray with you. That your faith remaineth in you. I want to touch and agree with you. That you can be steadfast and unmovable. Always abounding. I want to pray for you. That the devil can give you his best shot. And you'll come right back up. If you come and get in a hurry, I'm getting ready to pray. There's some folk in here feel like God is not concerned with the load you carry. You feel that God is not concerned with the burden you under. God is not concerned with you crying all night long. But I'm here to tell you the devil is a liar. He knows what you're going through. He knows the pain you keep. He knows the burden that you bear. And when God is done trying you, you coming out with a new dance. You coming out with new anointing. You coming out with new joy. You coming out with new favor. You coming out. Coming to 
past. I want you to praise him like it's already done. One, two, three. Give God a praise. powerful books you will ever read in your lifetime called The Assignment. Everything created solves a problem. Lawyers solve legal problems. Mothers solve emotional problems. My eyes see. My hands reach. My feet walk. My mouth speaks. My mind thinks. God has a plan for you. He designed it. You discover it. It's the only place you can prosper. I'm Mike Murdoch. I'll be right back. What is the golden secret to uncommon success? What is the hidden mystery to achieving